Uh, here's the reality. Sometimes I feel I know what I'm going to preach on and begin to prepare a sermon for it, but then for whatever reason, I begin to sense the Spirit moving as individuals hearing this sermon title, whoa, 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 they thought, it's great. He's finally going to slow down and explain a whole lot of stuff that we haven't yet figured out. And so as more and more people said that, I thought, well, it's important for you guys to know where we're coming from. And a lot of people are excited about this series that we're doing through the book of Revelation, yet... Uh, they recognize that there is a lot of information and there's just, even in terms of the approach that I am using in terms of sharing it and explaining it and teaching it and preaching it, is not really even familiar to a lot of people because of just where we are as a society and, and which view has kind of permeated uh, Christianity in the United States. But the reality is I do want to slow down because people are sharing the sermon series and, and people are trying to figure out, kind of jumping in with each week and saying, well, wait a second, I don't fully get this. What exactly is happening here? And so I just thought we'd do a little whoa and go over just a few things. And I recognize just with the baptisms at both services, I didn't get to the second half of the sermon. So what I'm going to do is already know that we're not going to go long because I'm just doing the first part so we both stay on the same path. However, I'll give you a teaser. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, they all are interconnected. They all lead together. They all are apocalyptic literature in that they follow the Old Testament phrases as well as concepts. In fact, this whole thing about locusts, you might be like, whoa, this is new and wow, this is so bizarre. And there's all types of people out there. They'll tell you that these are referring to Apache helicopters and all kinds of crazy stuff. But the issue is, is that locusts as being a sign of God's judgment, as being that which can devour and ruin everything. Now remember, we're talking about an agrarian society. And yes, for about five months every year during that growing season, there is always always the threat of locusts, and sometimes they would swarm. And so when we are reminded that, that these tr seals, these, these trumpets and bowls have a lot of correlation with, with Old Testament prophecies, as well as the plagues that were unleashed upon Egypt for their rebellion and Pharaoh's rebellion against the command of God, we see that these aren't new concepts. Locusts have always been referred to. In fact, basically the idea of them thundering and sounding like chariots comes from the Old Testament, comes from passages in Ezekiel, Joel, as well as in Isaiah. So it's nothing new. If this is new to you, then the reality is, is this is a good reminder to be more aware and to really engross yourself in the Word of God. Because if not, then you'll watch a movie or you'll read some books or some series of books and you might feel that that's how things are going to be. So just a few things to remember. First of all, I want to say that there are different views in how to interpret Revelation. In fact, there's, there's basically four basic approaches to just interpreting the entire book. And what I want to be clear on, of course, many of you who've been at Pinewood know that, you know, I'm, I'm sarcastic and I poke fun at other views and things. Just because I do that doesn't mean that I think less of those individuals. There are godly individuals who will be closer to the throne of God than I will be in heaven who hold to a different view. Some who even hold to the view that I believe is not in line with Scripture, that I do believe that they are in error, but we have more in common with fellow believers than we differ when it comes to Christianity and what we believe. And so when we are united in things concerning God existing eternally as one God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and that Jesus, the second person of the Holy Trinity, fully God, took on flesh and became human, so that he might live among us, so that he might represent us, so that he might deliver us from sin and from Satan and from death, and ultimately to bring through his righteousness, which is imputed to us, salvation and justification. We have that in common. And so if you hold to a different view and you've been irritated by the fact that I've made fun of your view, get over it. <laughs> it's going to still happen. It's still going to happen. But I want to let you know that I do love you. And it's all in good fun. But what I'm in trying to do is to have you think at least to come to your own conclusion where you stand on this view. Because there is liberty. That there are views that you can hold to and have that ultimately might be different than mine, but yet still be in line with Scripture. I will argue that the main view in the United States of dispensational premillennialism 
is in error, that it is incorrect, and that it has caused a lot of issues, I believe, with where we are even today because of the distraction that it's caused for Christians where we've sought to disengage and kind of hunker down until the rapture occurs as opposed to being those through whom the kingdom of God is to come in, around, and through us. That we are those agents of change, those ambassadors of the gospel, the witnesses of Jesus, who are making disciples of all nations, who believe that the gospel is the power of God into salvation for all who believe. And so as such, even though I believe that they are in error, I do believe, ultimately, that we have more in common than we differ on. So I know we're having issues with there, so you're just going to have to help me out and run through my slides because it's not working up here at the moment as well. It's probably switched off. So, hey, we're back in the sanctuary. Satan's got to have something to mess with. That's the way I look at it. But nonetheless, the four basic views that we have, the first is dispensational premillennialism. All right, that's the, that's the very first view that we have. And it is the view that you find not so much in Scripture, but you're going to find it in the Schofield Study Bible. You're going to find it written out in a fictional way, because it is, it is fiction, in the Left Behind series. You might cringe while you watch, but you're going to see their theology in the 1970s movies, A Thief in the Night, or a distant thunder. Maybe you grew up in youth group or at a WANA program like I did where we had to watch that every year. And it literally scared the hell out of me. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be left behind. And so I had, it wasn't a love for Christ or a desire to serve him. It was, that doesn't look good with the stamp on, you know, the tattoo on your forehead and all that kind of stuff. But now we know it's microchips. Oh, actually, it's vaccines. Sorry, it's all of this. I'm kidding. You see, this is where this view goes. You just begin to think that what is happening today is somehow happening elsewhere. So we have this premillennial dispensational view. Now, these are, these are actually the four views I, I kind of messed up there. So let's go back to futurist. Go back to futurist here. I'm going to try to do it all from memory. Futurist. So the first view of interpreting Revelation The first view interpreting Revelation is that people have a futuristic view, all right? And you're going to meet individuals who have this futuristic view. What does that mean? It means that they believe that everything in the book of Revelation is yet to happen, that all of it is in the future, that nothing in Revelation has happened yet, that it doesn't happen until the very end before Christ returns. That's a futurist view. The problem is, is it kind of goes against John who said, this stuff's going to happen soon. And so John's either a liar or God's word isn't true. Now, we can think that somehow 2,000 years is soon, but we know that's not the case. That futuristic view is that everything is in the future. Nothing has yet happened. We then have the historic view or the historistic view, which believes that, that basically things are happening right now all the time, that Revelation just speaks of basically the church from its very beginning to when Christ returns. So it has that kind of, all of history is summed up in Revelation. And there are parts of that that kind of other people hold to. I do believe that there are aspects of Revelation that do apply to all of history. Just like the book of Ezekiel applies to all of history. Meaning it's true for when it was written and it's true today. Now granted those things were written in a specific time, in a specific place for a particular people, for particular reasons, yet we are able to glean from it concerning who God is, what he expects of us, how he operates, what it looks like to be faithful, and then ultimately what are the consequences to disobedience. And so we have that. Remember, the Bible, all of it was written to somebody else at a different time for a particular reason, yet it's all truth and it applies to us today. So that that historic or historistic view, uh, historicist, is basically the view that, yes, it it just speaks in general of all that is going on. You have the ideal view, and the ideal view says it's basically symbolic, so we don't know what's happened, we don't know what's going to happen, but it's all symbolism. So that's where you can kind of say that maybe, maybe the mark of the beast is this, or, or maybe the, uh, the four horsemen are, are these world leaders. You begin to kind of think of it as symbolism, that it's kind of just out there, and it's anyone's guess as to basically what it means. And those who hold to this view, they all have different views each generation. Of course, when I was growing up in the 80s, everyone, lo- everyone loved Ronald Reagan, 
But we are all cautious because his name was Ronald Wilson Reagan. Ronald has six letters. Wilson has six letters. Reagan has six letters. By golly, don't like him. He's the Antichrist. We didn't know what to think. Hal Lindsey was telling us that Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. All these types of things. There's this idealistic view that it's all symbols. It's all just out there and you've got to figure it out like a huge scavenger hunt. And then, of course, the, uh, the final view is, well, my view. Preterism. Now, granted, I'll be clear that I'm not a full preterist, and I will make sure that while we're being video recorded, I will say I'm not a full preterist, because I believe full preterism is heresy. Preterism believes that all of Revelation has already happened. And for full preterists, they believe that when Jesus is speaking of his second coming, he's not talking about coming again in terms of to end all things. That is a type of second coming that ultimately when the end of the world occurs. But rather, they believe that Christ was speaking of judgment upon Jerusalem, that that was his second coming. That's a full preterist view. I don't hold to that. I am partially preterist or a partial preterist, which means I do believe a lot of revelation has already occurred. Because just like Ezekiel, uh, just like Exodus, just like every other book in the Bible, it was written to a particular people at a particular time concerning, in this case, a particular event that was to occur. And that is the destruction of Jerusalem and God's judgment against unbelieving Israel for the murdering of Jesus, his only begotten son, who came as their Messiah. And those, he came to his very own, but they did not receive him, but rather crucified him. That this is ultimately a judgment of God upon the nation of Israel, that first century nation that denied Jesus as the Christ and ultimately put him to death. But I also believe that there's parts of Revelation that are still to come. One of which is Christ's visible return at the very end when it's all over. That's when we will be raptura, where we'll be caught up in the air with him. Remember, we talked about the rapture. It comes from the Latin Vulgate, raptura, meaning caught up. And it's mentioned just once. So there's this whole doctrine of the rapture that's been made up based upon one word with one occurrence in the Bible. And not only that, from the Latin Vulgate translation. They believe in a secret rapture that will occur. So those are your four main views of interpreting the Bible. Future, it's all in the future. Idealistic, it's all just symbols. Uh, it's all of history meaning it's just all of, of the basically now until Christ returns, and then ultimately preterism, which is some stuff has already happened, some stuff is still yet to occur. So those are the four ways to interpret. I interpret it from a partial preterist way, which means that most of these judgments were judgments that are now upon Israel that we read about and have read about in the Old Testament when they are judgments against the enemies of Israel. You see, what we see here is ultimately Israel has become Babylon. Israel has become Egypt. And the curses for disobedience and breaking the covenant ultimately results in these judgments, these seven seals that lead to the seven trumpets that lead to the seven bowls. Now granted, when we look at that, we can see truth that applies to all of our lives. It applies to us. So we read Revelation knowing that a lot of it has already been fulfilled. But yet the concepts are timeless because God doesn't change. If we don't think of Revelation in that way, then we can't really read any other book of the Bible. If we don't realize that it has been fulfilled, it has already occurred, yet its principles apply to us right now. That's why we study God's word. Even though when we read of events that happened in ancient Israel during the time of Judges, those events have already occurred, yet we recognize how easy it is for us as Christians to basically syncretize or assimilate into the cultures around us. And we can see that even today when more and more Christians begin to accept or even defend or even believe that, that God is in favor of some of the things that we're seeing concerning sexual identity, sexual uh, choices, and other things that are contrary to God's word. 
we begin to normalize them or we begin to say, well, that's not really what he was talking about. We recognize those things apply to us today. So you have four various interpretive approaches. Remember that, and you need to decide which you are. And hopefully in the end, you'll at least have the opportunity to understand one of the views, which is my view, which I believe was the traditional historic view ultimately, but yet uh, is lost favor in the United States. But it's coming back, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. We then have four views of the millennium. Now, we're going to get to the millennium in chapter 20. It's still a ways to go, and so we're woo, we're wooing right now. So it's a long time before we get to chapter 20, but we will get there. And in chapter 20, you will read of this 1,000 years, a millennium. And there are basically four different views concerning that 1,000-year time period. The first is the dispensational premillennial view, meaning they believe that Jesus will come again visibly and he will set up a kingdom in the new temple in Jerusalem. And he will do that after he's raptured away the church. So for them, they believe the church is secretly taken away. And in dispensational premillennialism, the reason why I, I, I just can't affirm any part of it is that it believes there are two plans of salvation. That God has his salvation through Jesus for the church, but he's still saving the Jewish people through the law. And we spent a couple years in the book of Hebrews to clarify the fact that Jesus is what everything was pointing to, and there's no way to go back. And if you go back, you're basically losing salvation because those were signs, those were shadows, all of which were pointing to Jesus. Let me tell you, there are not two plans of salvation. There has always just been one, all the way from the very beginning, back in Genesis 3.15, where the promise was made that the seed of the woman would ultimately destroy and crush the seed of the serpent. That proto-euangelion, that first pronouncement of the gospel. And all the way through scripture, it is Jesus. We know him by name. In fact, that's what we, we, we sang about. They looked in faith to the Messiah who was to come. They didn't know who it was going to be. And ultimately, the generation that did receive him on earth put him to death. But for us, we, by faith, look back to what he has done. There's only one plan of salvation. Any view that breaks it up that says God has multiple plans, multiple dispensations, different ways that he operated. That's where they get their name, dispensational. They believe God operated at different times in different ways, saving people differently. We believe that it all points to Jesus, whether it's events like the flood or the judges who came to deliver Israel, the sacrificial system, the setup, and the architecture of the temple and the tabernacle, it all points to Jesus. So a dispensational premillennialist believes that ultimately for a thousand years, Jesus will reign in Jerusalem. There'll still be evil. There'll still be death. There'll still be disease. There'll be all these things. And then after the thousand year, there'll be a gathering of all the enemies of God. And in a great battle of Armageddon, he'll ultimately destroy him. And then the church will come back and everything will be great. And it's the end of all things. Historic premillennialism has some similarities, although they believe that Jesus that Jesus uh, is the way of salvation, the only way, that ultimately uh, in their uh, understanding, it's Jewish people coming to faith in Jesus. But they also have that thousand year that Jesus will be physically on earth and he will reign, yet there will still be death, disease, destruction, war, and problems. It, even the historic premillennial view doesn't make sense to me. Either Jesus is a bad ruler or he's not very good at conquering his enemies. Yet, people hold to those views. The third view is an amillennial view. You probably find this predominantly as the one that is held by most individuals who are Reformed or Presbyterian. They'll hold to an amillennial. Ah, from Latin meaning no. So they're believing that there is no millennium. Now, that's incorrect. That's not the best description of it. What they believe is that that thousand years being referred to is basically from when Christ ascended into heaven to when he returns. All right? And there's a commonality between amillennialists and postmillennialists with that idea that there is going to be this time right now is the millennium. 
And that thousand years is more a, a number, symbolic number, stating the, the fullness of time or the, 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 the completeness of things. And so we have with Christ ascending into heaven until he returns this thousand years, or that's the millennium. And then finally, you have postmillennialism. All right? Postmillennialism believes that Christ will come at the end of this millennium, but what postmillennialists believe, we believe what the scripture communicates concerning that thousand years, that ultimately it is an expansion of the church, that the church and the gospel wins and continues to grow, that the kingdom of God will fill the earth just as that rock carved out not by human hands that Daniel saw in the vision ultimately supplants all kingdoms and fills the earth. I do believe that the end times are good times, that the closer we get to Christ's return, the better things become as the church is faithful. Now, there's a group of individuals out there who are amillennialists. They understand that they want to have that hope also in the power of the gospel. They don't want to believe that it's just like, you know, evil's going to continue, good's going to continue. In fact, for most amillennialists, on millennialists, they hold that, that the parable of the wheat and the tares is kind of a description of their view, meaning that during this time there's going to be some wheat, and it says that, the, that an enemy has sown in weeds, and then the workers said, hey, why don't we tear up all the weeds? And they said, no, 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 let them grow up together. We'll take and separate them when it comes to the harvest. So for an amillennialist, many of them believe, well, the church is never going to really get ahead, but it's not going to really get behind. It's just going to try to survive and, and hopefully uh, save people and bring them into a right relationship with Christ, but you're always going to have the, the tares, the weeds that are going to, to also be pros, uh, prospering and and, and doing their thing. But there is a group that says, well, wait a second, we do believe that the gospel is going to win, that it's going to, to overcome, that it's going to uh, actually um, win the day. And they call themselves optimistic amillennialists. And I've talked with a bunch of you who like to use that phrase. I just want you to be clear, optimistic amillennialism is early onset of postmillennialism, just telling you that. That's, I'm just telling you that's that's what it is. It's early onset postmillennialism. You're going to get there if you keep being optimistic like this. Yes, I do believe the gospel is the power of God into salvation. I do believe that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And it's not done by violence, and it's not done through some political process or who is our president or who gets elected or which party is in power, but rather it is individuals whose lives are being transformed through the gospel individual believers who say we have a job to do and a responsibility and we should stop just getting caught up in the pursuits of this life and rather pursue and seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You see, if you have concerns about my view not looking like it's working, it has nothing to do with the view or with the gospel. I want to let you know it has to do with us, you and me that we're the only method and means by which the gospel advances in our nation. And it's disappointing to see where we are as a society, mostly because a lot of us have given up. A lot of us have not taken seriously the call to evangelize, myself included. I, I seek to be intentional about it every day, and I, wanna, and I ask the Lord to, to open opportunities for me to talk about it. And, and I've told you, it's easier than you think. If you just start talking with people, nine times out of ten, you talk with them long enough, they start talking about spiritual things. Because it is God's desire that all people are saved, meaning he finds no pleasure in punishing the wicked. So if God is desiring this and I'm sharing it, I'm not surprised when, when even when I don't even make sense that people say, that is the smartest thing I've ever heard and the best thing I've ever heard. And I'm like, how can that be? I didn't even, it didn't even make sense to me. But by the foolishness of what people preach and by what we communicate, people are saved. And so, friends, I just want to encourage you to have greater faith, a long faith, in the gospel. And just, I don't even know how to say it, just test it. Test the Lord that as you go and you just interact with people, and if your intention is love and a desire to see them come to the knowledge of the truth, you'll be amazed at what the Holy Spirit does. People want interactions. They want the presence of God. They want to hear his voice. They talk about these things. Let me tell you, some of the best places to do that is one, being silent, and two, talking about Jesus to others. And you want to see God show up? He does. 
So the reality is I want all of us to recognize that if we're not seeing our nation spiritually where it needs to be, we got to look at ourselves and say, who are we inviting to come? I mean, if you're worried about sharing the gospel, bring in a pine wood. And I will tell them that they're worse than they think they are, that they are dead, black-hearted sinners that think only of themselves, yet God in his grace has provided a way of salvation through his son, Jesus, who is fully God, who took on flesh. He came to earth, and he perfectly obeyed the law of God, something that you and I could not do. But then at the end of his life, he was put to death and died a horrible, painful punishment that you and I deserve because of our sin. He took that upon himself. And more than that, he gives to us his righteousness so that you can be fully and completely forgiven, that when God looks at you, he doesn't see your shortcomings, your failures, your faults, your sin. He sees Jesus. And Jesus takes your place when it comes to what is owed by you and what is necessary and required of you. Jesus does that all. I mean, that's, that's the gospel. In fact, the hardest thing about it is to admit we can't do it on our own. And that is what, struggle, what people struggle with. But for you and I, we should be sharing that message that it is only Christ and Christ only is the basis for our right standing before God. So next week we'll get into all the other stuff of the, of the you know, the, the seven trumpets. We'll finish those up as well as the third of, and then also the, uh, the going into the bowls ultimately at the end. So we'll get to that. Don't worry, we'll get to it. But I just want you all to have a sense of knowing what it is that you believe and what your personal view is concerning the book of Revelation. And so look up these terms. You know, if you, you're able to, to get these, just Google them. They'll, it'll help you out. Now, granted, not everything is correct on the internet. One of the things I, I was going to say is that I'm, as a partial preterist, post-millennialist, if you look that up, you're going to find individuals that I disagree with. I'm not a theonomist. So for those of you that know that word uh, and understand what I'm saying, you know that I'm not that. If you don't know what that means, it's individuals who believe that the law of the United States should basically only be the law that you find in Old Testament Israel. All right? Means they want to start stoning people. Which, by the way, I'm probably not against because I think that would be much more deterrent. Probably be a better deterrent in some ways, you know? As you're picking up a stone to throw at the, at the, at the perp, you know, you realize, wait a second, if I do something dumb, that could be me. So it's a little bit better in terms of a reminder, hey, try not to do stupid stuff. But I'm not a theonomist. I'm not a reconstructionist either, which also are those that are seeking to basically transform the United States into a theocracy. That's not me either, you know? That's not how I believe change occurs. I don't need laws to be changed in the United States. I live the way that I do based upon the law of Christ. The law of love is what dictates it. I don't need a, I don't need a law to tell me to love my wife or to love my kids. I do that because that's what Christ calls me to do to give and to serve and to, to, uh, to humble myself before others. These things are because of what Christ says. There's no, there's no law. I'm not worried about it. In fact, Paul says that in Romans. If you're doing good, you don't have to worry about the civil authorities. But I do recognize we're in a difficult place. And, and finally, I, I, like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a full, not a full preterist either along those lines. I'm not a Christian nationalist. There'll be individuals who, who are partial preterists, post-millennialists that are all trying to change the United States into a biblical nation reflecting Israel. I, I don't need that. I want to see individuals live within the United States and live under the laws that, that they establish. But the reality is I want individuals who just leave me alone and allow me to preach the gospel. And so there will be issues at some point. In fact, I don't normally recommend to watch stuff I just, just because my interests are, are eclectic. But I do want to say this. If you have Netflix, there's a documentary called Ordinary Men. And uh, I just watched it on Friday evening. And, and it was it really, well, it was pretty powerful. And it's about basically the Nazi death squads who were ordinary citizens. You see, they weren't in the military. They weren't, they weren't those who were off fighting on the front line. These were carpenters, uh, salesmen, you know, grocers, uh, clockmakers. They were just ordinary individuals. And yet, their job was by far the most heinous of all that was happening in Nazi Germany. They were the ones who would go up and basically execute point blank 1,500 to 2,000 people every day. They would do it. And, and the documentary is like, how do you get to this point? How do you get this point where individuals are able to shoot their neighbors right in the face? 
And as they were kind of showing the progress of what they were doing to the minorities and particularly the Jewish people, I was listening and and just saying, well, well, that's kind of the United States now with Christians and conservatives. That ultimately we're being stigmatized, we're being labeled with all types of names, and as such, it won't, it shouldn't surprise any of us if a neighbor wants to shoot us in the face or does so in the future. However, if we don't like that ending, the solution is, is to see people come to faith in Christ. You know, the Roman Empire wasn't changed into a Christian empire by lobbyists, Christian lobbyists, or trying to get rules changed or whatever. No, it was the power of their witness. It was them living their lives. In fact, that's what our mission statement here is, to declare and demonstrate the gospel so that all people can discover and develop new life in Christ. We want you to be declaring it, speaking about it, talking about it, but we also want you to be demonstrating it, meaning we show how marriages are to be. We show how parenting is to be. We show how we are to pursue uh, goals in this life as we do it according to biblical principles. And so that's the way that the things will be different and change. That's the power of the gospel. And that's my view. And as the church rises up, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. The issue is, will the church rise up? So your takeaway is this. Let's get to work, all right? We've got plenty of space here. You've got plenty of neighbors and coworkers. Bring them here if they're not going anywhere. Invite them to come. Or talk to them about spiritual things. Or just let, listen to them. And you'll be surprised how often they begin to ask the questions and then be even more surprised when you who don't believe you're able, which by the way, you're not, but the Holy Spirit enables you, you'll be able to say things and be able to communicate truth that might not even make sense to you, but will make sense to them because it is the power of God. And so yes, be an optimistic amillennialist. Be a partial preterist postmillennialist. The end times are good times. Let's get to work. Let's show the world, just as the early Christians did, converted an empire by their witness. Let us do that. Let us be as vocal about Jesus as so many are about their political positions.